Welcome you all for another session on Pearls to Secure Distinction in Medicine Law Case. So today we are going to discuss another interesting law case that can commonly appear in your exam. That is about chronic diarrhea. Today we have Dr. Duraj, who is a recently graduated doctor from Peradeniya, who is going to do the role playing as a medical student. So he is going to present me a moderate summary at the end of the history and examination and after that we will be discussing this case as in the exam. Right. So can you present a summary of your patient? Mr. Kumar, a 50 year old male who was recently diagnosed with diabetes mellitus presents with a 2 month history of loose stools. It is large volume bulky stools without blood and mucus and at a time with undigested food particles. It is associated with central abdominal pain. During this period, he has lost 10 kg of weight and complained of on and off fever and night sweats. On examination, he is emaciated with BMI of 17 kg per square meter, moderately pale, without pills. Cardiovascular and respiratory examinations are unremarkable. The abdomen is soft and non tender. With no hyperesplenomegaly, he is neurologically normal. All right, very good. So, in this particular patient, so what are the factors that will point towards an organic cause for his diarrhea? Loss of weight and fever and night sweats. Okay, so this is one of the common questions that we ask in the exam. So, at the exam, we expect the student to identify this part early in the history. So the students are expected to establish the likelihood that the symptoms are organic. So this is based on alarm features. So what are these alarm features? So if your patient has a chronic diarrhea which is going on for 8-9 years, that makes it less organic, make it more functional. But if the history of diarrhea is less than 3 months, that is an alarm feature that might hint towards an organic cause. The second thing is presence of continuous or predominantly nocturnal diarrhea. And if your patient says, yes, he has diarrhea and it's named during the daytime, but he has a teaspoon 10 hour of sleep, which makes it more functional. And the third thing is, if your diarrhea is associated with significant weight loss, that is again another alarm feature. So, presence of a short history of diarrhea and predominantly nocturnal or persistent form of diarrhea and a significant loss of weight point towards an organic cause. Okay, so in this patient, what do you think is the type of diarrhea? I think it is small bubble diarrhea as he passes bulky stools with undigested food particles. <laughs> right, very good. So, in the history, differentiating the type of diarrhea is extremely important because that helps you to narrow down your differential diagnosis. So broadly we can have two types of diarrhea. So one type is the small bubble type of diarrhea or what we call a malabsorptive form of diarrhea versus there can be a large bubble type of a diarrhea which is basically colonic type or inflammatory, colonic inflammatory type of diarrhea. So in the history you should attempt to differentiate this small bubble malabsorptive form of diarrhea from a chronic or large bubble inflammatory type of diarrhea. So what are the things in favor of a small bubble type of a diarrhea? So usually these patients tend to have large amount of bulky stools and sometimes they can have steatoria. So stools will be large in quantity, pale in color, and they may have offensive smell and they will be difficult to flush away because of the fatty nature of the stool. And also, particularly in patients with small bubble diarrhea, they do not have most of the time blood and mucus in the stools. And also, when it comes to the abdominal pain associated with diarrhea, usually this localizes mainly to the periambulitis or the central abdominal area. But in contrast, if it's a large bowel type of a diarrhea, usually the stool amount, the quantity is less in volume. There are small amount of solids and the patients tend to have blood and mucus in the stools. 
And at the same time, they can have a lot of, lot of factors in them. Like they can have teenagers, feeling of incomplete evacuation of students, and sometimes the presence of PER. And the main thing, large bowel tract of the diarrhea mainly localizes to the lower abdomen. And the other important thing, sometimes in the history, this may be not that easy. Sometimes patients can have the mixed type of diarrhea where they have both a mixture of small bowel and large bowel symptoms. So, okay, so in this patient, you think small bowel type of a diarrhea. So, can you tell me what are the complications that you would anticipate in this sort of a patient? He is emaciated, most likely due to the malnutrition. He is pale, he is at risk of getting infections. So, this is again one of the important areas that the student is expected to be aware of complications of a long standing small bowel type of a diarrhea. So I agree. So he discussed about malabsorption and the patient is at risk of protein energy malnutrition, which can clinically manifest as cachexia. And at the same time, this particular patient can have is at risk of vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So he has theatoria. So he can have defects of fat emulsification, which can lead to fat soluble vitamin deficiencies. So vitamin A deficiency can manifest as night blindness, vitamin D deficiency can manifest as ball pain and osteomalacia, and vitamin K deficiency, the patient can present with uh, bleeding tendencies and easy bruising, etc. And also patient can have the risk of electrolyte imbalances, particularly hypokalemia and hypomagnesia. And in profuse small bubble diarrhea, which is going on for a long time, patient can develop chronic dehydration and also the patient is at risk of developing recurrent infections. Okay. So in this particular patient, what do you think is the cause for this small bubble type of diarrhea? In this patient, given small bowel diarrhea, steatoria, and weight loss, and recent diagnosis of diabetes, I would like to consider chronic enteritis, but he has no history of ethanol and no history of recurrent abdominal pain. Given low grade fever, I also like to consider chronic infections like TB. Also, I like to consider small bowel lymph. Very good. So, that's a very good approach. So, in the history, we expect the student to hunt for a meteorological cause for the diarrhea. So after differentiating the diarrhea, whether it's a small bubble type of a diarrhea from a large bubble type of a diarrhea, we need to consider a set of differential diagnoses. And this differential diagnosis should be in priority order. And most importantly, common causes need to be considered first. Because the examiner would not be happy if your first diagnosis, most likely diagnosis, for the small bubble diarrhea, if you present as um, something like people's disease or topical stroke. Right? Okay. And then the other thing is when we present your differential diagnosis, always present things which are in favor of that particular diagnosis, and also tell the things which will make the diagnosis less likely. Say, for instance, in this patient, if the patient has cetoria, and the recent history of diabetes mellitus, you can consider chronic pancreatitis as a possible differential diagnosis. But at the same time, you can present he does not have a history of recurrent abdominal pain, and he does not have a history of heavy ethanol consumption, which makes the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis less likely. So, in this particular patient, the presence of fever and night sweats is an important point in the history. So chronic infections, particularly infections like tuberculosis, need to be considered up in your differential diagnosis. And similarly, conditions like small bowel lymphoma, again can present with small bowel type of diarrhea, low weight fever and night sweats need to be considered. Also, this patient is recently diagnosed with diabetes mellitus and he was started on lymphoma. So metformin is again something you need to consider, which can be a culprit for a patient who has chronic diarrhea. But in this case, there are a few things against metformin as the most likely cause because the patient has significant loss of weight, 
has fever and nitrates. And also, in the diabetic patient, you need to consider diabetic related neuropathies presenting as chronic diarrhea. Again, here, he does not have any other microvascular complications. He does not have any peripheral neuropathy or anything else to suggest other autonomic neuropathies, which makes the diabetic related neuropathies as the most likely cause for his chronic diarrhea. Okay, so how would you investigate his chronic diarrhea in this patient? Full blood count, ESR, CRP, stool, stool report, and ultrasound scan of the abdomen and consider scope. So, investigating a patient with a chronic diarrhea in a resource poor setting like Sri Lanka, the investigations need to be tailor made according to the patient because it is not cost effective to do all sorts of investigations because either they are not available in the hospital or they are very costly. So in this sort of patient, there can be certain investigations which can point towards an organic cause, particularly a patient with a high ESR, iron deficiency anemia and having low albumin can point towards most likely organic cause for chronic diarrhea. So when we start investigating the patient, we can start with stool examination. So stools for visual inspection will give us the consistency of the stool and tell us whether there is presence of blood or mucus. And sometimes we might find the presence of worms in the stools. And then we can do the stool full report, which will tell the presence of red cells, white cells, and epithelial cells. And then stools can be tested for presence of lipid and reducing substances. And also stools can be tested for amoebic OAM cyst. And then there are certain special tests that we can do on stools such as stool lactoferrin levels and stool calcopectin levels which will be elevated particularly in inflammatory type of small bubble diarrhea. And once we get these basic tests done, according to the priority of the differential diagnosis, we can arrange the other investigations. Okay, so how would you visualize the small bubble of this patient? I will arrange endoscope for the patient. Capsular endoscopy can also be used to visualize the small bubble. So this is again an important area that we question about. So examiner expect the student to be familiar with various imaging modalities that can be used to visualize each part of the bubble. So particularly if it is a esophagus, barium swallow or upper GI endoscopy can be used. And if it is a stomach, again a barium meal and the upper GI endoscopy can be used. And when it comes to the lower bubble, the colon can be easily visualized using a colonoscopy. Or sometimes, depending on the area of interest, a proctoscopy or a flexible sigmoidoscopy can be used. But in this particular question, we want to visualize a small bubble, which is a large segment of the bubble, which is not easily accessible either from the upper end or from the lower end using the endoscopes. So, the proximal part of the small bubble can be visualized using the upper GI endoscopy, which can look up to the second or third part of the duodenum. Similarly, we can use a barium mean and colon food to visualize the proximal part of the small bubble. And again, we can use the capsule endoscopy or the enteroscope to look at the small bubble. And the distal part of the small bubble can be visualized using a colonoscope where the ileum is intubated and the biopsies can be taken from the distal ileum. If you suspect tuberculosis of the gut in this particular patient, how would you arrange your workup? I will arrange MAN2, chest x-ray, sputum for acid fast vaccinate and then I will arrange a coloscopic guided biopsy from the ileum and send for acid fast vaccinate and TB. So investigating gut TB is challenging because most conventional TB tests are having very low sensitivity when it comes to the gut. So, GI imaging can suggest the possibility of tuberculosis, such as asymmetrical wall thickening of the terminal ileum, cecum or ileum cecal valves associated with necrotic lymph nodes. After chronic inflammation, the cecum might appear small and irregular due to fibrosis and stenosis. In this sort of patient, we can do a hard to test, which can be positive, but it does not confirm the active infection. And we might do a chest x-ray which might show the evidence of previous tuberculosis. 
So the gold standard would be if you think of practical ketosis, we can arrange a colonoscopy with ideal incubation. An ideal biopsy can be tested for TBPCR, which has a great diagnostic accuracy. Okay, so that brings to end of today's discussion. So far I have done a few other long case videos which are available in my YouTube channel. And also I am expecting to do a few more long case videos. And if you are interested, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. Good luck.